Christmas. Merry Christmas. There you go. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's just the whole idea. This is, this is Christmas Sunday to me. I know Christmas is Tuesday morning, but today, Sunday, this is Christmas Sunday, and people come all. I think people just come for that fact that it's a Sunday right before Christmas, and it's a big deal. And I think you're kind of excited about it. I guess I can tell how many excited about Christmas. I know the kids, yeah, the kids' hands just go up just like this. And then the parents' hands, yeah. We're waiting for Wednesday. Uh, but we're really excited. I'm excited that you're here. And, and, and I thought it'd be kind of cool right now uh, if you would just turn to somebody that's sitting around you, in front of you, beside you, or whatever, and just tell them Merry Christmas. Go ahead. Just tell them Merry Christmas. Okay, okay, okay. That's enough. That's enough. That's enough. <laughs> you know, some people, I just, I don't know. I, I, I just like to hear people say that. I, you know, I, I'm not a happy holidays person. I'm a, I'm a Merry Christmas person. And I was, I was telling somebody just a little while ago as they were leaving. Uh, they'd been here all morning. They were getting ready to leave. And I said, I hope, I said, I hope you have a joyous Christmas because there's a Merry Christmas, but then there's a joyous Christmas. And it's just above the Merry. And so uh, I just, I think people should uh, enjoy Christmas that way with a lot of joy. Now, if you're here with us for the very first time, uh, we're in this series called God With Us. And uh, we've been looking at just that phrase right there, God with us. See, that phrase right there is a foundation or the centerpiece, the centerpiece of why Jesus came to, to, to be with us, to, to live his life among us. It's that whole, it, in the past few weeks, we've been looking at the whole idea of God's presence with us, that God is with us in and through the valleys. What we learned in that week, that first week of this series, we learned that it's, it's, it's not always our life is always up on a mountain where we experience the presence of God, but it's down in the valleys. It's down in those valleys that we actually get to know God intimately, that we actually seek Him, and His presence is right there with us to guide us through the valleys. Last week, our students, Pastor Eric, Eric shared with us about God being, in, God being with us in the storms. When our life circumstances and the situations that happen in our life toss us into the middle of a storm, God's presence, God's hope, and God's peace can be found right there in the storm. Sometimes it's like we have to get into the storm to really see God's presence and really feel God's presence when we call out to Him. Today, what I want to do is, is I want to look at another aspect of God's presence in our life, but I want, to, I want to look, you know, each week we're using this verse, what I call our series verse, based, based on our, what we're going to be talking about, and we've used Matthew chapter 1, verse 23 for the past couple of weeks, and I want to do the same thing, but I want to back up and just add a little more context to that 23rd verse, a little, a little what happens right before that. So in Matthew chapter 1... Uh, verse, starting in verse 18. Not, not many verses, just a little bit before 23. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. He said, Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And then our verse that we're using for this series. All of this occurred. All of this happened. Everything about the Christmas story, all of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. And the prophet that they're talking about here in Matthew is Isaiah. Because if you go to Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14, these are the words that you will read. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. That God is with us. In this, in this passage right here, in this little cluster of verses right here, we're introduced to the theological doctrine of the incarnation. The incarnation. Do we know how to explain the incarnation? Do we understand the incarnation? Have we ever heard anybody talking about Jesus and refer to Jesus as God incarnate? Maybe you've heard a preacher or a teacher say that phrase, Jesus is God incarnate. And I thought it's very important for us to understand this incarnation that we've just been exposed to here in Matthew. 
to understand a little better. So I look for the source, the source of all wisdom, the source of all knowledge to help us understand the incarnation. Wikipedia. I mean, you can ask your phone, you can ask Siri about it, and it's going to, this is what I found on the internet, and she's just going to give you Wikipedia. So I thought, well, I'll just go to Wikipedia, and I'll look how it defines the incarnation so we can understand what happens in the incarnation. This is how Wikipedia defines incarnation. In Christian theology, the doctrine of the incarnation holds that Jesus, the pre-existent divine logos, logos is a Greek word for word, so it holds that Jesus, the pre-existent divine word, and the second hypostasis of the, the Trinity, see we're getting in big words here, the Trinity, that's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, so the second one, God the Son, the, the Son of the Father, the Son of the Father, taking on human body and human nature, was made flesh, conceived in the womb of Mary the Theocritus. Another Greek word for God-bearer, that Mary carried God in her womb. That's all it's saying. And then the doctrine of the incarnation then entails that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully human, two natures joined in hypostatic union. Did that make it clear? Yes, we got one person. That makes it clear. See, I have what they call masters of divinity. I went to school for this, and all that taught me was I don't know what I thought I did. That's all, and, and, and I looked at this, and I read this over and over and over, and I broke it apart, and I went back and read it again, and I'm like, these words like hypostatic, and all. so I thought, why don't I find an easier way to explain the incarnation? Because we have to understand, the incarnation, it's a cornerstone belief for those of us who say Jesus is Lord. If we don't understand the incarnation, if we don't even believe in the incarnation, then we do not have a relationship with God that we thought we did. This is cornerstone to us. So I thought it's gotta be an easier way because these big words in here, in Greek words, they mess me up. So I found this in the Gospel of John, the very first chapter in the Gospel of John, the very first couple verses, John chapter one, starting in verse one, and it says, this is what we read, in the beginning was the word. In the beginning was the logos, Jesus, the preexistent divine logos. He was there in the beginning. This is not just the beginning of the book. This is the beginning of time. He was there. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. So he was there with God. And catch this, and the Word was God. So he was part of God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They're all one. He was with God in the beginning. At the very start of all time and all creation, the Word, Logos, was there. Then you get down to verse 14, and it says the Word, the Logos, Jesus, the divine, preexistent word, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. See, the incarnation is when God the Son entered into our world in the flesh as a baby named Jesus who would save the people from their sin. He would be fully God, fully human at the same time. It was not one week that he was God and one week that he was human. He was both at the same time. This was God incarnate. This is God in the flesh. This is God with us. And when we read that, this is amazing just to read this. To read this, that this is who God, God came to earth. And it's also convicting for a lot of people who don't consider God coming to earth. But can you imagine the conversation that took place? The conversation that took place in heaven between God the Father and God the Son about what was going to take place, about, about how God's plan for us, God's plan to rescue us and God's plan to redeem us, God's plan of salvation and God's plan of forgiveness, how all that was going to be carried out and what it would cost. Can you imagine that conversation between God the Father and God the Son? Could it have been something like this? Son, this is your mission should you choose to accept it. Dun, 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 dun. I'm sending you, I'm sending you to earth to be a sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin for all people. And God the Son, that we refer to as Jesus, said, send me now. Let's just go ahead and take care of it. The world's a mess. Just send me. Wait, 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 wait. Hold your horses. 
I've got a plan, but it's going to take you nine months to get there. What? Nine months? Send me now. Why can't I just, boom, just show up right there? On, you've been a couple times, and you've just shown up to people like Abraham, and, and why can't I just go? Do, I've got a plan, son. I've chosen for you the woman who will be your mother, and she's going to carry you. You'll spend nine months in her womb. She's going to love you, and you're going to love her. Her name is Mary. She, she's going to be an amazing mom for you. She's a young teenage girl, and she's completely devoted to us. She prays to us. She worships us. She's pure in every way. Son, this is important. She's a virgin. She has, because you, you, you cannot be conceived by an earthly father. You cannot have an earthly father that conceived it. It can't happen because if you do, then you'll be born with a sin nature. And you can't be born with a sin nature. You're not going to be born with a sin nature because I'm your father. I'm your real father. And she will carry you for nine months. And then you, when you're born, you'll be completely human. And divine. You'd be fully human, fully God. Now, I know it sounds a little confusing for people, but that's how it's going to, that's how it's going to come out. And, and, I, and I've, also, I've also chosen your earthly father. His name is Joseph. He's a good man. He's going he's gonna to raise you. He's going to teach you things like carpentry, how to work with wood and how to form things out of wood. But more importantly, he's going to demonstrate integrity in front of you. Now, now, most people, understand, most people would expect you to be born in a palace because you are, quote, unquote, the son of God. But I've chosen a more, uh, let's just say, uncommon place. I've chosen a stable, or more, more specifically, I've chosen a cave where people keep their farm animals to be your place of birth. And when you're born, people are going to come from all over searching for you, looking for you, just to see you. And they're going to bring gifts and they're going to bow down before you. And they're going to worship you. Many people in the world are going to, be, a world are going to, just, are going to celebrate your arrival. But at the same time, son, every demon in hell is going to hate you. And they're going to try everything they can to get to you your entire life. They're even going to convince a king to pass a decree to kill every child, boy, two years and younger, to stop you. Satan himself is going to come after you because of who you are. And he's going to test you. And he's going to tempt you. And he's going to try to convince you to bow down to him. He's going to try to convince you to give up everything and worship him for all that he has to offer. But son, I want you to stand strong. We've written down what you're going to tell him as your answers when he comes after you. You know what to say. And then God continues. Now, all the power, son, all the power you have here in heaven, you're going to have on earth. But use it wisely. Don't play with this. Just because you don't want to take a bath, don't part the waters. Just because you don't like broccoli, don't turn it into chocolate cake. Use it wisely, son, because the words you speak can change things. And just so you know, I've already prepared your first miracle. When you become of age and you start your ministry, I've selected the first miracle. You're going to, you're going to change water into wine at a wedding feast. What? I'm the son of God. Water into wine. I know, son, I know it doesn't sound like much, but it's going to mess with Baptists for decades. They're going to they're gonna wonder, is it really wine or was it a non-alcoholic beverage? It's going to be so much fun. You just wait. You just wait. But seriously, seriously, son, you're going to do some amazing miracles. You'll be able to speak and calm a storm. You'll be able to walk on water. The blind will see. The deaf will hear and the lame will walk. You'll heal the sick. Son, you'll even raise the dead with a word. And still, people are going to hate you. 
They're going to say you're demon-possessed. They're going to say you're a liar, you're a lunatic. They're even going to say that you're my enemy. But I want you, what, what I want you to do, son, is I want you to show them who we are. Show them love. What I want you to do is I want you to reach out to the least of these. I want you to befriend prostitutes, tax collectors, the hurting, the oppressed, the lonely, the overlooked, and the forgotten. But understand this. The more that you show love, the more you'll be hated. And I know you'll feel alone at times, but I'm going to give you some friends. Good. I was thinking I was going through this all by myself. No, I'm going to give you some friends, 12 men. You're going to invest in them. Three and a half years of your life, you're going to be teaching them. You're going to love them. They'll be called your disciples. And they're going to follow you and go everywhere you go. Listen to everything that you teach, and they'll take it all in without even realizing it. They're going to love you, and they're going to be loyal to you until they're not. There's going to be one. His name is Peter. He's the loudest of the bunch. He's going to speak out of turn so many times. You'll get tired of it, but he's just, he's just boasting all the time. He'll even say that he would never leave you and that he'd even die for you. And the first opportunity, the first chance he's given to stand with you, the first chance he's given to stand up for you and defend you, he's going to deny you three times. Three times, son. That's going to hurt. And then there's one. His name is Judas. Now, Judas is going to betray you for just a few pieces of silver, even after you tell him how you're going to give your life for him. You'll explain to him that your body was going to be broken for him. You'll share that your blood is going to be poured out for him, and he'll still betray you. You see, they don't understand. They won't fully understand this mission and the cost of it, but you will. And it will begin to weigh heavy on you. You'll even question me about this mission. You're going to ask me. You're going to come and ask me, is there some other way to do this? And I'm going to tell you then, just like I'm going to tell you now. No, there's not. There's no other way. You're going to have to die. You're going to have to die on a cross for these people to save them from their sin. And after much prayer... you'll choose to be obedient to my will. Son, they're, they're going to arrest you. They're going to falsely accuse you of things. They're going to do some kind of kangaroo court and try you. Then they're going to beat you and whip you so bad that you will be unrecognizable as a man. You'll go through more pain than any man has ever gone through before. They will make you carry the cross that you'll die on. Then they're going to throw you down on it, and they're going to drive stakes through your hands and your feet. They're going to strip you naked, and they're going to hang you up on that cross so the very people that I'm sending you to to love, the very people I'm sending you to to rescue, the whole point of this mission so these people can come by and spit in your face and mock you and say, Hail, King of the Jews, you saved others. Why don't you save yourself? And I'm going to be so infuriated and so upset with them, it's going to take everything within me from keeping, from sending legions of angels to stop all of this. But because of who you are, you're going to ask me to show mercy and forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Son, it's going to be a bad part of the mission. But it's going to get worse. You see, when you're on the cross, I'm going to place all the sin of the world on you. All the sin that's present and all the sin of everyone yet to come. I'm going to place it on you. And when I do, you're not going to be able to find me. Now, don't get me wrong. Once I send you to earth, I'm going to be with you every step of the way. From the, the moment you're born, I'm going to be through the, the nine months in your mind. I'm, I'm going to be there the entire time watching you. 
listening to you, talking with you. But in that moment that you become sin, all the pain you've experienced up to that point is going to pale in comparison to me turning away from you. Because I can't look on sin. And you, I'm going to hear you. I'm going to hear you cry out to me. But I can't listen. I can't, I can't, I can't turn back. Son, you're going you're gonna to die for the sins of the world alone. And in this darkest, this, this is going to be the darkest moment, son, and when you feel so uh, abandoned and so alone, press on. Press on. And when you have completed everything, when you have completed everything that we've told the prophets that you would do, everything, then you declare, I want to hear you, son. Say it's finished. Let me know you're done. Then I'll have you buried in a borrowed tomb. Borrowed because you're only going to be there for three days. Because I'm going to raise you back to life. Because you've completed the mission. You, you, you will have defeated death. You will have defeated the grave. You would have gone through everything. You, you, would have, you will become the, the perfect sacrifice for the sins of the world once and for all. Never again will this have to be done. You, you will prove to the world how much we love them. Do you understand? This is your mission, son. Are you willing to go through? Will you do this? See, now, I, in my mind, and I'm listening to this conversation when I'm reading in the Bible, and I'm reading the Old Testament, how the prophets say this is going to happen. And you get into the New Testament, and you start reading about Mary's going to have this little baby, and, and you start doing the Christmas story, and all. You start re- I hear all this stuff going on, and I'm wondering, why would Jesus agree to do all that? Why would he re- agree to go? Because if I'd been part of that conversation, if, if, if God were to sit down with me and say, all right, Ronnie, this is going to be your life. I'm going to tell you your entire life from start to finish. Everything that's going to happen in your life, all the good stuff and all the bad stuff. If I would have God sit down and tell me everything that's going on, would I accept his plan for my life knowing that my life is going to have moments in it where there's going to be excruciating pain, there's going to be so much suffering that there would be even death in my life? Would I accept that as his plan for my life? Probably not, because we don't like pain, and we don't like disappointments, and we don't like failures, and we don't like struggles in life. We don't want to have that in our life, so we probably would not agree. But yet Jesus sits here, and he, he hears all of this, and he knew every step of the whole plan for his life, what it was going to be like for here on earth, what he was going to deal with, and he came. He knew all of this before he came, and he still chose to come here for us. Last Sunday, Eric was sharing something, and I, and I would come into service and listen to him. He's like, you know, you want to make sure he doesn't say anything that's going to embarrass me. So, you know, and, <laughs> and, and so he's talking, and he said something. And I, I, I don't like to say this, but I took out one of the envelopes in the back of that little pouch there in the back of the seat, and I grabbed a pen, and I started writing right there on the offering envelope because he said something that was just I had not heard before, and it just spoke truth to me. In that moment, and I, I kept it in my po- I've kept it in my pocket all week as I was working on the message, and I get it out and I look at it. And even when I talked with Eric this week, I opened it up and I said, "You said this Sunday." And it wasn't like he said anything wrong. It wasn't like he th- said anything that was damaging. He said something that I don't know. We've heard things like this. We've seen cards like this. We've seen it get posted on Facebook, any kind of social media. media you know, put Christ back in Christmas. Jesus is the reason for the season. We see sweatshirts and sweaters and stuff, but Jesus is the reason for the season, and it's right, okay? But the truth is, we are the reason for the season. We are the reason the Word became flesh. We, us, all of us. I was telling somebody between services, if, if, if God didn't care, if God didn't love us, we wouldn't be celebrating Christmas this week. We were the reason that he came. And I'm, I'm, 
I'm going to do that in my head, and I'm hearing this conversation that I imagine in heaven between God the Father and God the Son, and we're getting close to Christmas. It's just two days away, and I don't know what traditions are in your families. I know in some families, in some places, even in churches right before Christmas or Christmas Eve, they read the Christmas story the Christ, in, the, in the Scriptures, from the Scriptures, Luke chapter 2. At, at, down at my mom and dad's this, this Tuesday night, my brothers and sisters and their families will get together, and every Christmas evening, we read the Christmas story from Luke chapter 2. This, this year is my youngest brother's. It's his turn. We keep track. So nobody gets, nobody, but it's his turn this, this, Sunday, this Tuesday. And I thought, well, you know, we're at church on Sunday, Christmas Sunday. I, I can't not avoid the Christmas story. I have to read the Christmas story. Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 7, that this happened. Luke is an investigator. He's a doctor. He does research. He interviewed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people just to put together his letter. Got all, he, did, he was like the first commentator. Verse 7. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, in a stable, in a cave where they keep farm animals because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Something has happened tonight for the entire world. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you when you go looking for him and searching for him. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And listen to the conversation between God the Father, God the Son. I'm hearing the Christmas story. I read all the Christmas stories and read different versions of the Christmas story. I've heard different versions of the Christmas story and the birth of Jesus. And, and going back to that conversation, are you willing to do this, son? And here was his answer in Luke chapter 2. Jesus had said yes. God the Son had said yes to God the Father, and he became flesh to live among us, to follow God's plan from start to finish. And because he said yes, because he became flesh, the heavens rejoiced. I've always wondered, why did the heavens rejoice? Because now they have an opportunity to meet us through Jesus. We become God's children through Jesus. Heaven rejoiced because God's plan, because Jesus said yes. So I, see, now I understand this, that Jesus said yes, and heaven's rejoicing that we the children of God. And then I go back to this verse that we're using for this entire series, Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, where it says, all of this occurred, all of this, the birth of Jesus, the plan, his life, everything. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message to the prophet Isaiah. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. This was all God's plan, and she will conceive a child because Jesus said yes. She will give birth to a son, a human baby, because Jesus said yes. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Jesus chose to be made flesh, to come and be with us, and not just for Christmas. Jesus is with us. He is with us always. Always. His Spirit dwells inside us as followers of Jesus Christ. His Spirit lives inside. Part of God lives inside of us. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. When we get lost, 
This spirit, his presence is our guide. When, when we're alone, this is our companion. When we feel like there's nobody else, he's right there in our spirit. When we're hurting, he's our comforter. When we're afraid, he's our peace. When we're sick, he's our healer. When we're weak, he's our strength. And when we feel lost in our sins, remember, he came to rescue us and save us from our sins because he is Emmanuel. He is God with us, God in the flesh. Always, not just Tuesday. This is how I hear Christmas. This is how the, 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 the heaven, the heaven sent God's son to us to change our lives, to change everything about us. So let's pray. God, there's so many things that happen this time of Christmas. We're, we're right this time of the season. Everything is so hectic, and everything is so rushed, and everything just starts to take over. And instead of making us joyous, instead of making us happy, it makes us depressed. It stresses us out. We start to get angry with people. We start to get short and upset with people. We can't find what we're looking for. We can't make such and such for someone, and somebody's not happy. Then They're not happy. I'm not happy. They're upset. With... Christmas has taken on the wrong persona. If we just think for just a minute that all of this, not, not the presents, not the trees, not the celebration, not the song, the Christmas, the idea, the reason behind all of this was us. We are the reason for this season that we celebrate. It's because of us. Can you just imagine how much God loves us to put together a plan like this? But then again, how much more his son loves us because he said yes and came to go through all of it, all the pain, all the attacks by Satan and demons, everyone, to die for us? Christmas is our reminder of how much God really loves us. We always head toward Easter and the crucifixion and the resurrection, but it's the birth of proof of God's love for us, the proof of Jesus' love for us. May we continue, God, may we continue to worship you and praise you not just today and not just Christmas morning, but every day. Because from the very beginning, your plan was to rescue us and save us. And we celebrate that plan put into motion in a manger, in a stable, in a cave. If we search for you, the shepherds and the wise men searched for you. We'll find you. And we'll find your love and your grace and your mercy. So continue to bless us this Christmas. Continue to bless us each day. And open our hearts and our minds to remember the love you have for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.